So your husband presents this idea of being a family again, and you go three days without eating. What were your thoughts? I don't really know where the bravery came from. I just thought, this is absolute hell where we're at. I just can't keep doing this. Seeing what it was doing to my oldest son and living in the fear of that any moment I would I could essentially be ripped away from my husband and my kids could be taken from me, given to another family, and I would be sent away and never to see them again was absolutely real because it was happening. And I kept my door locked because I, I refused to open the door for anyone. I lived in fear all the time. So obviously the FLDS at that time had no temple. So where were you married? At the Ruland Jeff's home there on the compound. Okay. In Short Creek. Yep. In Hilldale. In Hilldale. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> if you want to be technical, but yes, in the, on the Hilldale side, it was the Ruland Jeff's home there that's on Utah Avenue. That, that's what I remember people going to Warren Jeff's or Ruland Jeff's home or offices to get married during the time that Ruland was still alive. Yeah. Yep. Yep, I was married there. Wow. Was there any type of reception? So it was common for whatever family wanted to take that on. It wasn't something that they did there at Ruland Jeff's home. It was you get married and then whatever arrangements you've made. So my husband's family let my family know that they wanted to offer the, the, the location and <clears throat> all of that to have a what I called the viewing because that's literally what it felt like uh, <laughs> you would literally be standing there and people I mean like his side of the family are like hundreds like he had like 70 something uncles and aunts and so their families and like it we were here probably <laughs> I don't know, three hours maybe just Letting people come through and saying, congratulations, welcome to the family. You can go in the other room and have a piece of cake. I feel like we had the same wedding experience <laughs> because it was the exact same for us. We were at, after being, I mean, we had the and temple ceiling, the but the ceilings are very similar. It sounds like as far as it goes. And for viewers who are like, you don't do vows, you don't say anything. No, you don't because it's considered an ordinance and ordinances are scripted and have to be very specifically worded. And you have to just, like you said, you agree, you say yes, or, you know, and outside of the temple, you normally say I do, but we're agreeing to specific covenants. As a matter of fact, I remember I said yes at the wrong time. Our officiator was starting to get choked up and I was so nervous that I said yes. And everybody kind of chuckled, like all of our friends and family kind of chuckled and and then I realized I said yes at the wrong time. And I was like, just really wanted to double down on my yes. But um, but then afterwards, it's the same. Like we had so many, so many friends and family. And I'd been in St. George my whole life. And so it was the same type of viewing. Yeah, where you go and there's the long line. And it's hard to describe for people who aren't used to that kind of thing. But when you have that many people in your community and everybody wants to come and say congratulations. And it was just a line, like a line out the door of this church. And they just came through for hours on end. And then we had to have like a cutoff time that people could no longer come and like give their congratulations anymore. Here, I'll show you a quick picture. This is my ex's dad. And he was the, the cutest guy. I miss him so much. Mm -hmm. But this is him eating cake. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> <laughs> he looks very happy. Yeah, oh, he was like so, so, so happy. Oh, I love him so dang much. What about uh, attire, wedding dress? What what kind of clothing did you wear for the wedding or ceiling? Just your normal, uh, your garments. Like, of course, your under your long underwear mm -hmm. and all of your under things and your dress. I never had a specific like. It had to meet certain standards other than what was already expected, like your modesty. Like as long as your neck and your sh cleavage and your wrists and your ankles, like the length of it, it had to meet and it had to be, it couldn't be flashy. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's it's very sacred. It's It needs to be simple, but 
as far as like a pattern or what it's supposed to look like, it was very custom, very like, there wasn't ever just a, a streamline, like this is how you do it. Did you already have one though? Did you have to like have one ready for whenever the call came? Because normally, you know, when you're planning, you get engaged, then you have months. It to was really a common thing. So the girls, when ready? they became a certain, it was a common thing to start putting together or planning your wedding dress. Oh, Did you wow. make it? I helped design it. Okay. <laughs> nice. I, I, some seamstresses here in town, I reached out to and they helped me. Um, I believe I had it made maybe a year before I was married. Okay. And I just had it stored in the back of my closet forever. Wow. Thought, I'm never going to get to use it. I'm never going to be able, I'm not going to fit in it when I need to, but I did. It worked. It was fine. Good. Wow. So interesting. We haven't had a lot of people be able to tell us a lot about what, how weddings were in the FLDS. Yeah. Obviously before Warren took over, because when he took over, everything became so secretive that oh. it's it's hard to know and it seemed like it was so rushed and so secret there was no feeling in it at all it was just you lined up like you were grabbed out of you know thin air thrown in a direction this life altering thing happens and you're off yes don't talk about it mm. don't tell anybody about it mm. it never happened but yet you're married yeah like, or eternity don't say who was there you don't get to talk about who was present the people you saw you don't talk about any of it crazy you yeah. put it on a shelf yeah wow you don't get yeah. to talk about where it happened no one was yeah no one was invited really yeah i think i'm i kind of missed all that craziness by i'm really glad that the experience that i had went the way it did actually yeah. Yeah. in comparison to a lot of other people because it was just only just under two years before all of that stuff started happening. Right. You just missed it. Yeah. So we were married and in 2002, I had my first baby, um, February of 2002 and had a son and my husband's dad and three, two brothers. So there was three biological brothers and a friend who was from the community in August on August 8th of 2002 were in an airplane flying mm. through Richfield and they were flying past or going to, they were on a, on a business trip essentially, but they took a little detour by the Richfield mountains and to go look at the mountain goats and the plane crashed and all four men died i remember that i remember that yeah and so that was one huge funeral and so my son was only seven months old when his mm -hmm. grandpa died so i only got to know him for a very short period of time mm -hmm. he was an amazing man i miss him so much yeah. my kids don't don't know him at all man that's mm -hmm. so tough i remember that that was that shook the community there was a lot of people a very big funeral and that was something that even though i was very young at the time it definitely stuck with me that was a uh a, a life-altering experience it changed a lot in my married life changed a lot in the community he so he passed away it was to the day, one month before his 50th birthday. Oh, wow. And so young. his dad's family, so the one I married into, was planning a big camping trip. And I was so excited to get to go. Like They were going all out. And it was a very ritual thing for their family to go camping and be. That's just what they did every summer. And they wanted to make this be a big bash for his birthday. And... Somebody else had other plans. So yeah. I just remember standing in line at the viewing. So many thousands of people, people from all over the world came. So his dad knew so many people. It was amazing that the people that I found out that he knew mm. from all over the world, there was people who showed up and were allowed to come through and pay their respects. 
was pretty incredible to witness. Yeah. Um, Because that wasn't a very common thing that happened, you know? I don't know if you remember much about the funeral, Sam, about how they went and what kinds of people they allowed in, especially in that setting, you know? Mm -hmm. I remember I went to the viewing. So I remember being in some way a part of it, but it was, like I said, I don't remember specific details. I just remember that it happened and um, Mm. that just shook the community. It was just so many, so many of these very well-known men in the community just gone like that. It it was a big deal. I just remember so many people that I had no realization of just how much of an impact these men had on not just the community, but (laughs) internationally, there's a lot of information behind all of that, but it was just, it just felt so endearing to know, like these men were very special and I had a lot of respect for them. So my husband's dad and a few of his brothers. So the ones that are actually in the crash were on that business trip for the station there. They were trying to work some business deals to try to help get it out of debt. Mm -hmm. And so they were on their way back home from that meeting. Wow. So none of those transactions and none of that stuff actually went through. So there was a lot of financial, family, physical, community, a lot of stuff changed and shifted in dramatic ways. So now my husband's family are scrambling to figure out their lives, a business, a trucking business that he had. And the funeral didn't even happen for two weeks because they had to do an autopsy on the pilot because he was flying and they have the protocol to, that's just what they have to do regardless. Nobody can request not. Yeah. So it was a good two weeks for the families to get ready and prepared. It was a very, very long two weeks. Sheesh, I'll bet. And there was a whole community effort to go up on the mountain and and actually D. Jessup was one of the men who organized all of that and some of his brothers to go and collect the shrapnel off the mountain. I don't know if you remember that. Not very well, no. Um, It was a community effort letting all of the people who were willing to go and help gather that up. I have a home video of that experience. Wow. Wow. So they went and gathered up all of the pieces. After it was inspected, you know, they couldn't tamper with the evidence because it had to be, because there was no survivors. There was no witnesses. It just happened. So Mm. they had to allow the feds or whoever it was to go in. And my husband and I actually were living in the same house in an apartment with his family in a separate part of the home. It was a, it's a big home and it's got 15 bedrooms, 11 bathrooms. Wow. And so when his dad died two weeks after the funeral, so one month after his moms were remarried, actually. Mm. Yeah. One month. That's so quick. That's just too fast. Well, you know, (laughs) that was a, a very common thing in the community. Like you just, Rip off that Band-Aid and, you know. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I do remember. I do remember it happened often, whether someone died yeah. or whether someone was forced out of the community. And yeah. the women, the wives would get remarried very quickly. I was looking back, it's way too fast. So essentially, the new family that they were moving into, we were going to be left without a place to live. Mm-hmm. So we had a baby. And we had another one on the way and we needed somewhere to be. So we referred to the bishop and he made some arrangements and found us a home to live with another couple that had a little baby as well. So we were placed a few months later down the road while the new family that was taking over his family, (laughs) his mom, his, both of his moms, uh, to accommodate to putting them all under one roof. And then that would vacate his dad's home because the Bishop had another plan to put another family in need in the home. Hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So, so you got to deal with being the mix match move around. We were the just church kind owns of the, all the property and yep. Wow. Yep. So we essentially didn't even really have a place to our own ever. Sheesh. That anyway. seems to be pretty common, unfortunately. A lot of families oh, yeah. were, were shuffled around and moved around quite frequently without much of a warning we're or a heads up. We're just tenants. Yep. yep. That's all, you know, you just, at Liberty, you move if you're being told to move. You don't ask questions, you know. Wow. So do you mind so, me asking how many, how many children you ended up having? Six. Six. Wow. I have six. Busy, busy household. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow. So fast forward. I mean, I, there's a lot that's occurred from then. So in 2002, when his dad passed away, exactly one month to the day, Rulin Jeffs died. Wow. Whoa. So there was like, bam, bam. Mm. Like... <sighs> Double Band-Aid ripped off. Like, <laughs> just let that bleed. A lot of shifting, a lot of changing. So right. um, actually he died on my, my dad and my husband's birthdays are on the same day. And Rule and Jeff's died on that day. On that day. Uh, it was a Sunday, wasn't it? Yep. We had planned. I wasn't there at that church meeting that day because I was... <laughs> Our family had put together a big program and a really, really nice dinner. And so I stayed home to make the dinner. We had family and friends that were going to come and enjoy it with us. We were going to have this great time. And everybody came home completely sober. And it was not a fun day. Everyone was mourning and crying and worried and... Well... Had you been... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say that... Part of that was we were told that ruling was Rulin was going to be the last prophet on the earth and before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Something I do along remember those I lines. recall some of that, but then Warren took the the light and took the stick and was like, This is my time to step up. He did, in. and he even claimed that he was Rulin, that he was mm -hmm. renewed, the renewed version. Just yep. right from the what? beginning, he he right from the beginning he twisted everything to make it seem like oh no this is what we've been preaching all along. I I'm thought just... Uncle Fred was going to be able to take that light. Like I really hoped that it had had been Uncle Fred. Things would have been a lot different had Uncle Fred. Can you imagine how out. things would have turned out? A lot different. We would have been able to drink wine. We would, <laughs> <laughs> we would still have plays. We would have the community. <laughs> he, he liked to. Uncle Fred liked to have some fun, and uh, he liked to have good wholesome entertainment and have uh -huh. everybody included. And I miss that man. <laughs> yeah, he, he seemed to have. Have a, a lot more of an enjoyable life surrounding him than the Jeffs did. The Jeffs were a lot more Absolutely. serious and duh, 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 this is the way it's to be. And anyway, authoritarian and very, yeah. But yes, there were claims that Warren was the renewed Rulin and that it yep. still is the same prophet. Yep. Continuing on the word. My father is, has changed. He's shapeshifter. <laughs> Yep. Oh, my word. How long was it after Ruland passed away? So that Sunday he passes away. How long was it after that before Warren did stand up and say, I, I think it was, I think it was person. that coming Sunday, that next church meeting where he stood on the pulpit and said, conform to my word. And everybody had already kind of acclimated to a lot of his twisted versions of a lot of stuff because people, who's going to, who's going to tell him no even in a public setting. Right. He'd been doing a lot of, he, he'd been kind of leading the community for a while, uh, claiming that he was doing it for his father and that he was doing things for his father for so many yep. years at this point that it seemed kind of natural because he had worked his way in there to make it seem like he was preparing for this. Yes. So it, uh, and I remember we came home after that meeting and father, brought us all into the meet or the family room and mm -hmm. told or bore his testimony to us about, you know, I believe that Warren is the next prophet. Uh, we're going to follow him. And, and so we all said, okay. And that's yeah. what we all did. So many changes in the community, you know, it's for a lot of people. I think they were 
faith testers. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people were struggling, especially when Ruth and Jeffs died and Warren stood up and said, I am the man now. And for a lot of, at least a lot of the people that were older that really tested their faith. So what was that like in your family? Was it fairly easy for your family to continue on believing in the FLDS belief at, and follow Warren Jeffs? Um, between me and my husband, we really struggled because number one, we had just experienced a huge grief, a loss in so many ways. One other reason is that he was working for his uncle who passed away at the same time. So that whole business, like no dad, no job, community is changing. Authority is changing. We don't have a home to live in. I mean, everything got pulled out from both of us. Mm. And so it was a, a very, very heavy time to even just feel like, to even reconcile or even reason, where do we fit in? What does this mean? Where are we going? Who are we? Who, who do you turn to? You know, he had lost his best friend, his dad, another best friend, a mentor, his uncle who he's working for, that was he, his job lost both areas of his life that were very, very critical. He's not going to turn to me. I'm not an authoritative figure. <laughs> I'm his uh, lowly wife that doesn't have the priesthood <laughs> and his priesthood head is changing as well. Right. His moms are moving into a different family that he has no associate. Like he knows of him, but now he's claiming to be his dad or at least taking on that authoritative figure. And <sighs> Can you imagine of just so much being uprooted, like to ask the question of like, how do you feel? It's like, we kick me while I'm down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, bring it on. What more can you hit me with? Like, mm -hmm. it just felt like very lost, very depressing. Honestly, like we yeah. both hit a pretty good low. I was just starting out with my second child. So I was sick. Mm -hmm. I was not in a good headspace physically or mentally. There was just so much trauma to try to figure out and just doing the best we can. Like yeah. that's all we can do is just make sure we're doing the absolute best we can. Yeah. Don't ask questions. It, it is what it is. It was so tough for so many people. And especially yeah. for those that like that were dealing with the loss of the, the man in the plane crash right before mm -hmm. just so much to take all at once. And, yeah. I uh, can only imagine. can only imagine. At this point, you clearly don't have the poof and the polygamous <laughs> dress. So at some point, your faith shifted. What were some things that led up to you having some concerns in the FLDS belief? When the UOBS happened. Yeah. Okay. Can you expand on that a little bit? So when a lot of the men were being segregated and taken away, from their families and their families essentially either being put under caretaker household associations or being placed with new families mm. and when the uh, the end of the world happened is what kind of we joke about it now mm -hmm. of you know the remember the night of new year's if you didn't get your call before midnight you knew you were no longer the elite or were not accepted into the uo so you were yeah. essentially on repentance from that point what year was that i think it was at the beginning of 2011 so it was like 2010 2011. okay because yeah. i remember some of sam's sisters and family members talking about that sam had already left at that right. point i was gone i left in 2008 thankfully i didn't experience that i missed the i missed the uh the multiple ends of the world before that one i, I was there for that but <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't stuff. there for the United Order stuff and this end of the world one. So, so you had to get a call to say that you were worthy. And if not, did you actually feel like the end of the world was happening if you didn't get that call? I just remember being in fear. I don't remember even really thinking like something's going to crash our house and we're going to die. Like it just felt like emotionally, spiritually, all of the things that we were, you know, all that belief system of just like, you're not qualified. So when I think about the level of where I hold myself and the experience that I had had with Warren back in fifth grade 
of him being on that high esteemed leadership and being acclaimed as this godly person that I struggled so much with to believe what kind of authority I'm going to trust him with and hold him to every, I didn't respect him. I couldn't, mm -hmm. I struggled with it so hard and all the claims that were being made that this was through him from God, the one word, you know, to the community that that stood and you didn't question again, you just don't question. If you're not called to be a part of it, you're going to have to do better. Were you and your husband together at this time or did your husband get separated? No. Um, so when that UO, when the first round happened and all of the new baptisms were occurring that at that time, essentially, if you weren't in the UO by then, you were, your marriage was null and void. You were no longer husband and wife. So, wow. you know, a very quick, like less than five second handshake or whatever they called it, you know, not even so much as a side hug. Like you just didn't intermingle. You didn't hold each other's hands. There was no affection at all. And even sleeping, like you don't stay in the same room, like bedroom, like you don't sleep in the same bed. Um, you sleep on different places of the home. Like there is a segregation in your home. And I had heard about all the separation and segregation. I didn't realize it's because they say you're no longer married. Well, you don't act as husband and wife because you no yeah. longer hold the priesthood because you're the men who held the priesthood before in the United order. The only way to hold the priesthood is to be in the higher order. So if you're not in the United order, you don't hold the priesthood. So you're no longer married. Wow. Oh my word. I didn't realize that connection. Like we had heard yeah. people say that, you know, one or the other, but I didn't realize that that's their reasoning as to why you couldn't have any affection anymore. And other women could essentially be called to say, you belong to so-and-so now. Yeah. I, and I've heard of that. And this is obviously all happening now. Warren Jeffs is in prison. Yeah. And he's, and it's he's, still happening. Right. And he's making all of these things happen from his prison cell. Yes. And at this time, I believe was this about the same time that everyone was told no more children are allowed to, no one can have children anymore. Yeah. Well, no relations like women, men and women do not intermingle as husband and wife. There will be no marriages. There will be no, or essentially no children being born. Those who actually were being given the privilege or the right to claim as being husband and wife, we're still not having children. Right. Children were not being brought into the community. That right. was not the focus. The focus was becoming more heavenly beings. And right. we're not focusing on having children. Along the lines of having children. So if you're uncomfortable talking about this, please just say you're uncomfortable. Um, I'm fine. Had, had you heard of the term sea bearers? Oh, yeah. Not till later, though. I mean, at oh, that time, was, every, later, later I did, I, so when the, when the first UO split happened, things were very hush hush because, you know, Warren was <laughs> nowhere to be seen, right. you know? And so a lot of this stuff happened by his word, but other people were carrying out those orders. Right. And so the ranch at the temple wasn't even finished. Hmm. So, or I don't think so. Do you, I mean, you may be wrong. Like what year was it finished? Yeah. So I believe the temple was finished or at least Warren was using it for what he called heavenly sessions before yeah. he was, before he was caught and put in prison. So that must've been 2006 ish. Uh, the community didn't get to hear. I mean, it was not a, it wasn't talked about. And those who did talk about it or knew about it, it was very, very secret, very secret. And you didn't get to know who went. And if you didn't see him anymore, you know, your best bet is, did they die? And I don't get to know. Mm -hmm. Are they at Zion, wherever Zion is? Yep. Who knows? Yeah. Um, and then I just remember after that segregation officially happened the first time like that, knowing what it meant that we were no longer married we were no longer husband and wife we couldn't interact that way anymore there wasn't anybody there to like in our home to make sure that that was happening it was just kind of an honor system you know like you just deal with your own moral capacity you know and just holding yourself to that standard and because you know god knows all 
Mm-hmm. And he will find out, you know, living in that fear of self-claimed doubt. Right. So my husband was working. He found a job in North Dakota. And so he was working on the well sites up there. Mm-hmm. And he did that. And so over time, like he would be gone for weeks at a time. And we would only see him. He'd be gone five, six weeks. And we would see him for maybe two or three days. And he'd be gone again wow. because it's such a long distance. And he was just working so diligently for the storehouse to turn in money. Right. I just remember we had so very little. I did my absolute best. We had just the minimal amount of food in our home. And I had littles that I had to take care of. And we weren't on any like, state help like food stamps or anything it was we were all through the storehouse and those who were repenting or at least not in the uo but they're on the repentance side of things then if you went to the storehouse it was like a separate corner of it It was like a segregated part of the storehouse that you could shop for only certain people you could talk to and there were only certain things that you could ask for because technically all that stuff is consecrated for the uo so again you're left without so you do the math it just was like you're damned if you do damned if you don't right so i resorted to a local food bank (laughs) which a lot of other people were doing and getting it that way like i do i was on wick like with my babies and stuff like but that was like gold in our house because that wasn't stuff that we could just come by all the time. It was rationed very, very diligently. And we saved everything. We processed the little bitty parts parts that I could, anything that we got extra, it got prepared and put in a jar or in the freezer to where we could ration it at some later date. Like I got really good at being, very (laughs) creative on how to put some meals together. Like living on bottled fruit was, Mm. I'm really grateful for that. You know, like if I hadn't had that, we wouldn't have survived it. Wow. That's just the lack of care that the church was giving to the members that still wanted to be obedient, still wanted to be active members. And they just, we were the afterthought. Yeah, well, if your husband could have used the money that he was making and sent it all home to you, your life would have been completely different. Right, right, absolutely. Um, Anyway, so kind of fast forward. There was a time where we just, we both poured our heart and souls to each other and, you know, kind of bore our testimonies and where we were at and what we wanted and what we're diligently looking for. And I have letters and things that were sent back and forth to each other of, it's just so crazy. I came across the letter the other day and I'm just like, I don't even know why <laughs> we just talk like this to each other. Like just the wording and the verbiage and the context mm. and the things that we were talking about and the things we were yearning for. And I'm just like, I don't even use that word anymore. It's just, no. it's, it goes against me so bad. I have so many trigger words. Yep. Yearning. Yearning is one for me too. Makes yeah. me want to vomit. <laughs> um just we both decided that well he presented the idea of saying hey because we can't we're not husband and wife anymore and it's too hard for me to be at home because i want to be husband and wife so badly it would just be easier if i just stayed up here and we kind of agreed on that and just like okay like we could have very minimal conversations. Like we kind of tested the waters with each other kind of being like, is that too far? Like things we were talking about or things we couldn't really just open up our hearts and be like conversation, like husband and wife could have. It was, it was very minimal, like kind of throwing it out in code, kind of testing each other to see if we could still get away with talking to each other but not fully say it out loud. It was very awkward. Not a fun time in life, honestly. So he was gone for a lot of months. Then he would come home. See, He would come home for the kids. 
We did never get to hug. We did never hold hands. I this happened for eleven months. Oh. Wow. Okay, I'm like a hopeless romantic. When you said you guys talked and like shared where your hearts were, I was like, and then he came down from North Dakota and took his family with and said, "Forget no, he, it. I'm I'll keeping. Get to I'm staying part. married." Okay. <laughs> I'll Please get to tell the me it gets. Tell me it has a happier ending because I'm like I need I need love to conquer all. Okay. It doesn't he, always. But he was a very romantic person. Like he was very good at gift giving and very thoughtful. Like for my 25th birthday, he gave me 25 gifts and I could open one present a day for 25 days and every day had a card. So Aww. that kind of wow. person. Thank you. It makes my, my <laughs> romantic heart feel a little which, better. Which means he really wanted it. He wanted to have this relationship, but the church just wouldn't allow it. It's just like torn between two, two worlds. Mm -hmm. It's like, I want both. Why, why am I being told I can't have both? Mm -hmm. And, and if I choose to have both, then I can't have either. Right. Exactly. So yeah. for fear that, you know, some of the women, he wanted to respect me on what I wanted because he didn't just want it one direction. It was like, do we want it? Yeah. And respecting me on like, he got to a place. So fast forward. Um, before we decided to walk away, he had been talking with some men up north that had been doing some research. We did, of course, we didn't have internet, and they had their own questions, and they were really good friends. And they got brave and presented him with their own insight and their own questions and their own evidence of things, of reasoning, of why they came to this conclusion, of why this was all BS, and but in a very respectful way. Mm -hmm. and got some questions rolling around, you know, and that, you know, to talk about the CES letter, <laughs> uh -huh. kind yeah. of like that same snowball or like you get your nose in there and you don't stop. Like it just keeps going. Yeah. And so one day he called me and he said, I've been doing some thinking and I just, I don't, want you to answer right away if you're not okay with it, but I just want to let you know that I want a family. I want my family. And if you want to be part of my family, I will figure out a way for us to be one. Mm -hmm. Good for him. And so he's like, don't answer me right away. Think on it. And when you're ready, let me know. I did not eat for three days. I was under so much stress and I cried so much crying, realizing that I wanted so much to be a wife again. I wanted to be a family. This was ridiculous. Like if this is really how life is going to be, because I always had this fear on my shoulder that at any time, which was real, Someone could knock on my door and say, your husband no longer holds the priesthood or no longer could ever hold the priesthood because he didn't hold the priesthood at that point, at least what we were being told, that you are, I'm either going to be sent away and my children are going to be taken from me or I'm going to be put under someone else's care. And I mm -hmm. didn't want either. Right. Yeah. My oldest son, he was 10 at the time, he was accepted into the UO. And so he was put under the direction of my husband's mom. She was his caretaker in the UO. He could not even read or write because there was no homeschooling. I couldn't homeschool my kids. I had no help. I did not know how. There was no, the information and the criteria, you know, like the school, like the, the information, the, all the books and all of the papers and all of the teachings and stuff were there. I didn't have a way to teach my kids. I had five kids at the time and I was still required to do all these things at home. Like I was burnt out. And with no husband there and no support. I was a single mom prayer every single hour. Can you imagine trying to get kids to kneel, kneel down every single hour on the hour just wow. to have a prayer? You'll be back yep. down on the floor 30 minutes later because it took 30 minutes to do it. <sighs> I'm not going to spend my whole day doing that. It got really, oh, I got burned in so many ways. 
But my son, he, he would go to these meetings and he would be gone for eight, 10 hours a day. Oh my At 10 years At old. 10. He did not, he could barely write his name. He went to a first grade class and that's when a lot of the segregation stuff started happening in the community. So schooling was not a priority unless right. you were in the UO and it was figured out and it made it important in that family to make that happen. So I was not a priority. My family was not on the totem pole to make happen. If I wanted my kids to have schooling, I had to figure it out. Hmm. So he, I just remember he would come home and he had his, um, Sunday jacket on and he would have this envelope tucked in underneath his arm and hidden so I couldn't even see it and he would run into the house and run to his room and hide that piece of paper I couldn't ask him what it was I couldn't he couldn't even read the stuff Jeez. he didn't even know what it was. he was just told that if his family even read the title their blood would be on their shoulders Oh my gosh. Wow. Because the people who were repenting or who were not in the UO were not ready for that. It wasn't something that they could have. They weren't accepted into it yet. And they, they couldn't have it. They couldn't even read the, the title on the front paper, let alone read the teachings inside the books. He couldn't even read it. He didn't understand it, but he was in fear. That's all he understood. Wow. Was like, and I respected him on that because I felt like I was doing my absolute best in the the requirements. Anyway, wow. I couldn't I couldn't provide shoes for him. I couldn't ask him certain questions about some of his needs. He had to get on the phone with his grandma and go in the the other room where I couldn't be a part of the phone call, and they would have to put in a request for any physical items that he needed. So if he had holes in his pants, he had to go and put it, call his grandma and ask her to request them through the storehouse. And then she would get those to him. I couldn't provide any of that. Basically, all I was was a caretaker to him to make sure he had food, make sure he had a clean bed and that he had his shower regular and he was available to go whenever the call was made. Oh wow. Lord. At so, 10 years old. Dude, at 10 years that's old. That's so sad. So your husband presents this idea of being a family again, and you go three days without eating. What were your thoughts? I just, I don't really know where the bravery came from. I just thought this is absolute hell where we're at. I just can't keep doing this. Seeing what it was doing to my oldest son and living in the fear of that any moment I would, I could essentially be ripped away from my husband and my kids could be taken from me, given to another family and I would be sent away and never to see them again was absolutely real because it was happening. And I kept my door locked because I, I refused to open the door for anyone. I lived in fear all the time. My windows were shut. I hardly ever let my kids outside to think back and realize how much of a childhood I was being forced to rob from my own kids. The toys gone. I mean, just a level of, I wished I could do it over again and hope that they don't resent me as a mom as they grow older. And just, I am here <laughs> for them to say, mom, life sucked. <laughs> I'd be like, let's talk about it. I'm here. I haven't gone anywhere. Mm. Anyway, so if three days go by and I call him and I said, I'm ready to talk about it. What are you offering? What does it look like? And he's like, I want to move out of the community. And it was like living in an out of body experience of like someone finally heard my plea. Someone finally got what I needed. You know, whatever it was, higher <laughs> being of like, okay, you no longer have to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. So we agreed secretly. <laughs> this is, this is the knight in shining armor part. <laughs> um, he said, okay. I said, well, let me think about it a little bit longer. And he said, because I wasn't completely convinced. Like I couldn't just come out and say, all right, let's do it. 
in my heart, I remember feeling I'm ready, but I just, I don't have enough bravery to actually physically make it happen. And he said, tell you what, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get a one-way ticket to Vegas because I would drive to Vegas and pick him up to meet the kids, bring him back here to the creek and visit the kids. And then he would get a shuttle and go back to Vegas and then fly back up north. That's how he traveled. So it wasn't uncommon for me to go to Vegas and pick him up. So we kind of were able to do it incognito. It was out of the ordinary. And my mom would show up. I would ask her to come and watch the kids. And what she did this time. And he said, tell you what, I'm going to get a one-way ticket to Vegas. And if you show up, That'll be the answer. If you don't show up, I will go back in, get a ticket one way, and I will leave you alone. Wow. <sighs> to have to make that choice for him or you. I'm Yeesh. like, don't let me have to decide. Are you serious? Like, that's so much pressure. Like, I would literally have to leave everything, everything. So I sat with it for a few more days and I just, I'm doing it. I don't know why, but I'm doing it. And I kept it a secret and I told my mom a lie <laughs> <laughs> so that she wouldn't question me because I needed this to happen. Like this was my one way out. So I showed up at the Vegas airport and there he was standing at the airport with a big bouquet of flowers. Hmm. And right then I thought I went to go park and I saw him standing there and he hadn't seen me yet. And I noticed him and I just, I started crying. I thought, how would that look if I hadn't showed up and he was standing there with a bouquet of flowers and he had to go back in, throw them away and go back home, go back up North and never see me again. So he found me, came running over, and gave me the biggest kiss. We hugged for so long. <laughs> How long had it been since you since you had hugged? Eleven months. Wow. Wow. Can't so, imagine. Yeah. Anyway, so that was kind of our beginning of like, okay, we're doing this. So I had to keep our relationship secret from everybody. So then I was I went back home and had to keep it from i had to be so careful about what i said and i had to just double step everything make sure that i hadn't said anything i hadn't let anybody on nobody caught on just try to pretend that i'm still yearning mm -hmm. so a few months later we found a rental in ammon idaho and the reason to tell my mom why we were moving was because we needed to be closer to where the kids' dad were. Because at that time, a lot of the community was dispersing in so many different ways that it wasn't a big deal to be gone. Like some of the men were like, take care of your families. Just do what it takes to take care of your families. So we kind of took that and ran with it and just quietly walked away. Mm -hmm. We didn't want a big drum dramatic scene. We didn't want questions. We didn't want to sit at the Lyle Jeff's table and give him all of our reasons. We didn't want to do any of that. We were like, we're out. Good. We don't have to give you our reasons. Anyway, right. so we did. We packed for three days. My mom came and we were living in a, for 11 and a, 11 and a half years, we lived in a 700 square foot apartment. Ooh. With six kids. There were five at, the, at that time. Wow. When we moved away, we had five kids. It was very, very tiny. It was cramped. But at least you got to be together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we moved away and slowly we were cut off by my mom. Then we lived there for a year and it just got to the point where my husband and I got like we were under faith crisis. Like we were deconstructing everything and then a few about five months later after we moved away we both became very angry and we did not like each other at 
all. Was this due to faith? You th do, you, do you believe that's where it came from? We just didn't know who we were outside that community. We had no, like, we moved into a new state, new community, new life, new beginnings, mm. trying to deconstruct how to parent, how to be a husband and wife that we had not been for almost an entire year, reconnecting emotionally, physically, trying to get our feet back underneath us, figuring out what we wanted, what morals do we want to keep? What kind of values are we teaching our children? Like everything. It was just a mess. Mm -hmm. We were not happy. We hated each other. Wow. We were talking divorce. We were talking about getting lawyers and separating and not ever wanting to like almost despising each other. Like we couldn't have a, a non yelling conversation on the phone. It was very ugly. Man, I'm so sorry. A few months later, we decided for the kids' sake, because I didn't have anywhere else to go. I didn't have a lot of family outside of the community. So I was like, I'm still mom to these kids and I need to do what's best. And I don't have a way to support them. And if their dad will support me supporting the kids, I'll make that happen and we'll just figure it out. So we decided to move to North Dakota and we lived oh. there for a year. Okay. Hated every minute of it. I was going to say, North Dakota, isn't there a fairly large FLDS population up in that area? Maybe it, it used to be South, South Dakota. Dakota. South Dakota yes. was the other Zion. Okay. Yes. Um, there are a lot of people who live in North Dakota, actually. It was where the oil rigging was and big boom up there. Anyway. Right, right. I, we both tried to make it work and we became a little bit more friendly and worked some things out and... Then I became really depressed and then there was that whole shaming thing of finding a therapist that was so heavily like voodoo. You don't know, you don't do that. Just to point out the, the therapist thing was looked down on from the FLDS belief. Is that that's yeah. what you're saying? Right. Okay. Oh, that was like complete, like <laughs> you don't go and talk to a therapist. You talk to God. You figure right. it out. And if and if you have questions, put it on shelf. So I was still deconstructing that. And to try to even be vulnerable or open enough to even talk to a therapist was like very, very scary. I didn't even tell my husband that I was even going for three months. Wow. Because mm -hmm. I was feared I was going to be judged because that's right. kind of where we were at. Anyway, mm. so... A year went by and we got the opportunity to purchase or put in a petition for his dad's home. Wow. In short, in short. Creek, in Hilldale. Right? In Hilldale. Wow. And when we officially left the church, you couldn't have paid us to come back. Like I didn't want to have anything more to do with it. I swore I would never go back. Absolutely not. I don't have nothing to do with it. But in that two period of time, a lot changed with the community, with the land, with how things were being run. And so things started looking a little bit better and things looked better than where we were at currently. And there was nobody else to get the home. So we put in a petition and we were approved. So as soon as our lease was up, we ran for it. <laughs> we packed as soon as we could and trekked the 1400 miles one way back to the creek and we've been here ever since was this the first time going back to short creek after after leaving um when we were in idaho i believe we came down one time okay so it had been years then yeah it had been about a year and a half probably since i had been back to the creek what yeah. were those feelings though as you because i every time i go back to short creek area and i come up over the hill and i see the town every every time still to this day i have these certain emotions these certain feelings how did it feel for you going back after everything that you had dealt with and experienced going back knowing i'm coming here to live to stay this time how was how was that was that difficult for you it was some challenging, but I was just mostly excited to have a new, it felt like a new opportunity, excuse me, to have kind of a, a new chapter 
because a lot had changed. There wasn't a lot of that patriarchal, patriarchal authoritative thing there. I wasn't fearing what was there. It okay. was just what I remember when I was there. It was like things had changed physically in the community a lot. And so it felt a little safer mm. and also a familiar home that I used to live in yeah. and being able to have a little bit more security for my kids because I was tired of moving. I was so tired of moving and I just wanted to have some roots. I just wanted to have some stability for my kids and that was a step in that direction of like, okay, this is what we're doing. When we were in Idaho, I tried homeschooling my kids through the K-12 system. I tried it for eight months or eight weeks and told them, nope, not doing this anymore. Mm. And so I took the plunge and put them right in public school. So actually I came across a memory on my phone today that yesterday was their first official day of school that many years ago. So back in 2013, oh, wow. So, wow. so, so you moved back to Colorado city, Hilldale, I, they're the same place. But. We, we are in Hilldale. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. In 2013. In 2013 is when you moved oh, back. 2013 in Idaho. So when we oh. officially moved away from the community, oh, okay. then you put them in school. The okay. kids hadn't had any schooling really like first grade wow. and that was it. So I had a fourth and fifth grader that had a one I had a first grade education. So when I put them into public school and they were tested, it was a whole intimidating experience of like trying to explain our situation and why they were the way they were. And I was fearful that I was going to have people come in and take my kids because I hadn't taught them. I was neglecting them because that was the fear in the community that, you know, that these outside people don't treat you right. And, I just had to work through it for myself internally and just give myself a little bit of grace and say, you're doing your absolute best. Be authentic, be vulnerable, be open, be honest, and just try to help them understand that you are a good mom. You are doing what you need to do and that you do want your kids to be educated. You do want to have a safe place for them. And some of them listened. Some of them weren't so easy to work with, but yeah, so I actually had a pretty good ex experience there in Idaho. North Dakota was a whole nother experience. I didn't like the school system up there. I wouldn't put any kids in school up there. But yeah, we now have our kids here locally good, at this school. Good. And we love it. <laughs> I was going to say, good. we've recently been to the community and have seen uh -huh. these new schools and new structures yeah. and new uh, new soccer fields and, and yeah. different things that are being built. And we just love to see the changes in that community yeah. it's so great to see people come back and be able to like rebuild it up and yes. bring it back to and kind of resemblance of happier times in that community so yeah it's a little weird even going to the public school now here in hilldale because that was the building where all of the baptisms happened so oh. in the cafeteria where they have the cafeteria now that's where the baptismal font was. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I guess you got to work with the buildings that are in the community, but yeah, that's it's a little I trippy. Never, um, I never went or saw that baptismal font. The one that I it was, was a big baptismal font. Oh, was it really interesting? And that was in the building where the school is now. Yes, the uh, elementary. Yes. Wow. See, I was after my time. The the baptismal font that I was familiar with was the one up on the hill, uh, kind of up up towards where Uncle Fred lived. Uh huh. Exactly. That's the only one I knew of. So yeah, so. they they Warren had them install that one and made it all it's creepy. It's creepy. <laughs> As per <laughs> usual for him, right? Don't expect anything less. He probably had his voice echoing through the halls at all times. You know. Well, we're glad to hear that you made it back. You have a home of your own now. How are things looking for you now? Do you have all of your kids with you? What's life like for you now? I am no longer married. We recently oh, wow. separated this year. And I am just trying to figure out life again. But on different terms, on personal terms. Like mm -hmm. figuring out for me individually, like 
just, I look at it as a new chapter of who I am becoming. I mean, it's just like peeling away an onion of like that life, that married life has been a wild ride. It's been an incredible ride. You know, you kind of wonder or have the question. Some people say until you think, you know, someone Mm -hmm. and, you know, people evolve, people change our beliefs, our wants, our desires, you know, the way we want to live our life, they change. And I kind of have just been faced with that this year of like, obviously we can both agree that we both gave our best and it's time to just let it be and move on. It's not been easy, obviously, you know, ending like we were together for almost 23 years. So in October would have been our 23rd anniversary. So I can't complain knowing that, you know, that much of my life that I've gotten to raise a family. I have two adult children and my, so I have a son, a daughter, another daughter, a son, and then two more daughters. So when we moved back into the community, um, there was just a lot of kind of trying on what we wanted. Did we want more kids? And if it was something that we could essentially tackle, was it something we wanted or was it just kind of a a hopeful wish? Well, I did get that. And we kind of had our, We kind of call her our do-over baby. (laughs) (laughs) And I have loved every minute of it, that whole experience. So witnessing other people in the community where, you know, they had kids in the community. And then when they took the split, then they continued to have more or just one more, whatever. They've had more kids. And I'm always curious to know, like, how do you feel about the difference of, like, your mindset of, like, raising your children and even the mindset around having your children, like the way you think about yourself and the way you, you know, engage in like thinking about that child and what their life is going to be like and the way you want to parent that child and how they're going to interact with other siblings. And all of that has seriously given me a lot more eye opening empathy and a little bit more grace for myself to say, you know, In a way, I kind of, on one hand, I want to do it over again and wished I could have given that to all of my kids. But on the other hand, I'm glad that I have the openness, like, or at least the experience to see both sides of what it's been like as a parent to know what we didn't have before, but now we do. Like, Mm -hmm. just a little later in life, a little late in the game, but Mm -hmm. she's been so much fun. And I've, she's five now. And um, so anyway, wow. so that's well, kind of a, that's so I'm fun. Glad, I'm glad that you were able to raise a child on your own terms. If that makes yes. sense. It you was know, under our own. Yeah. And that can be scary. I don't know, at least in my experience, like when we um, left the LDS church and we had a three-year-old and I remember when you, when you, belong to a religion that tells you so strictly how to parent and all the things you should be doing as a parent. It felt really scary to say, okay, I'm going to make these rules. And like, I'm not, I don't have this organization to tell me exactly how to raise my child. I have to go with my instincts and with Sam's instincts and decide together. And that can be scary and intimidating. (laughs) It was really scary. At first it was very, it didn't, it didn't take long for us to really enjoy it. Yeah. To have that freedom. Yeah. But at first it was terrifying. Well, you have to learn to trust yourself, to trust that well, absolutely. I innately have motherly instincts that are capable of raising a child yep. in a good, mm-hmm. healthy way. And sometimes I think we can lose that when we're in a high demand religion. It's oh, easy yeah. to forget that piece of yourself. And so I don't know yeah. if that was the same for you, but it's scary I- but empowering. <laughs> experiencing um being a part of the repentance meetings and stuff with my little kids as they were you know young young children and them not understanding what's going on and being a mom and under the pressure of being quiet and you know i i witnessed when warren would call in from his prison cell and have him over the over the speaker and everyone would just have to drop everything and just sits completely still so that 
everybody could hear every word that he was saying. I remember this one particular meeting where there was a question being asked. I don't even remember what it was, but we were asked to agree or disagree. And everyone had to stand up. And there were eyes on all corners of the room, the security, oh, wow. to pick out the ones who did not answer. Wow. And I remember in my heart <laughs> wanting to say no. I, I said nay. <laughs> it wasn't yay. It was it was a in tongues, you know, like saying nay or yay. I said nay, but it looked like I said yay. <laughs> What an experience. I, I just, everyone has such a unique and important experience to share. We want to thank you once again for being willing to share your story. You will be surprised how many people your experiences will help and help them feel like they're not alone and they can also make choices for themselves and, and break past some of these holds that uh, have been placed on their lives. So Thank you so much for coming on and sharing yours with us. Yes. And on that same note, we'd like to ask people that we interview um, kind of one final question to wrap it up. And it is, if you could speak to your family or friends or people that are still in the community and know that they would listen, what would you want to tell them? Listen to your intuition. Like that is a tell all of finding your way to be brave enough to step in you know, like you have questions, you have the ability to decipher what's right or wrong for you. The decision of making that choice of what you do believe in, make it be your choice and not someone else's. And just be you. Do it for you, not for anyone else, but for you. I love that. Oh, thank you so very, much. Very wise words. Thank you so much, Elise. Thanks for spending the last four hours with us. <laughs> we <Yes. laughs> really enjoyed getting to know you. For our viewers, if any of you would like to hear more about what it was like for Sam to grow up in polygamy or listen to stories of people who are so brave and courageous coming out with their own stories of what it was like for them to grow up in polygamy, like Elise, please like and subscribe and we will talk to you all soon. Thank you all so much. We'll talk to you soon.